This is Cashflow Ninja, episode 123, with Doug Casey. Welcome to the Cashflow Ninja, the podcast empowering and inspiring people to discover how to generate their own income and manage, grow, and protect their own wealth in the new economy. Now, here is your host, MC Laubscher. Hello everyone, MC Lobsher here and welcome to another episode of the Cashflow Ninja. I have a great show for you today and in today's show I'm joined by Doug Casey. Doug Casey is a best-selling author, world-renowned speculator and libertarian philosopher. Doug Casey has garnered a well-earned reputation for his often controversial insights into politics, economics and investment markets. Doug is widely respected as one of the preeminent authorities on rational speculation, especially in the high natural resource sector. Doug literally wrote the book on profiting from periods of economic turmoil. His book, Crisis Investing, spent multiple weeks as the number one on the New York Times bestseller list and became the best-selling financial book of 1980 with over 430,000 copies sold, surpassing big caliber names like Free to Choose By from Milton Friedman, The Real War by Richard Nixon, and Cosmos by Carl Sagan. Then Doug broke the record with his next book, Strategic Investing, by receiving the largest advance ever paid for a financial book at the time. Interestingly enough, Doug's book, The International Man, one of my personal favorites, was the most sold book in the history of Rhodesia. And his most recent releases, Totally Incorrect and Right on the Money, continue the tradition of challenging statism and advocating liberty and free markets. Doug just also recently released the book, Speculator, that he co-wrote with John Hunt, and that is a must-read for anyone listening. He has been featured as a guest on hundreds of radio and TV shows, including David Letterman, Merv Griffin, Charlie Rose, Phil Donahue, Regis Philbin, Maury Povic, NBC News, and CNN. And he's been the topic of numerous features in periodicals such as Time, Forbes, People, and The Washington Post. And he's also a regular keynote speaker at Freedom Fest, the world's largest gathering of free minds. Doug has lived in 10 countries and visited over 175. Today, you're most likely to find him at La Stancia de Cafajete, an oasis tucked away in the high red mountains outside Salta, Argentina. Cafajete most resembles the isolating beauty of Bruce Canyon, Utah, combined with the lush vineyards of Napa Valley. Residents enjoy economic and social freedoms not found in the U.S. and some of the best wine and golf on the planet. Please share your feedback and thoughts with me on today's interview. You can let me know your thoughts on Twitter by tweeting me at MC Lobsher or by email at info at CashflowNinja.com. And please remember to join our mailing list by signing up at CashflowNinja.com or texting CashflowNinja, one word, all capitalized, to 44222. That's two fours and three twos. Have you read Rich Dad, Poor Dad? Are you interested in real estate investing and don't know where to start or to get the results you want? For valuable information to get you started, visit JoinOps Properties at joinopsproperties.com. Globally, coffee is a $90 billion industry and international coffee farms offers a sustainable income opportunity through offshore sustainable agriculture. You can own a parcel of your very own cash flowing specialty coffee farm in Panama. For more information on this income opportunity, you can download your free report at cashflowninja.com forward slash Panama. Listeners of the Cashflow Ninja can also grab a free audiobook download from Audible when you try Audible for 30 days. You can grab your free audiobook download at cashflowninjabook.com. Doug, welcome to the show. Well, thanks, MC, and I'm very glad to be here, although by here, I mean both on your show and in Punta del Este, Uruguay, where I'm currently looking at the beach. Fantastic. Is it a beautiful day out there? It is. It's delightful. The water's warm and uh, everything is pleasant in this backward little socialist country. <laughs> it's surprising. Fantastic. Well, 
Uh, Doug, can you please share a little bit about your background and your journey with my listeners that's not, that are not familiar with Doug Casey? Mm. Well, uh, I guess I uh, came on the scene when I wrote a book in 1977 called The International Man, uh, a guidebook to making the most of your personal freedom and financial opportunity around the world. And the book did very well uh, selling around the world. In fact, it became the largest selling book in the history of Rhodesia, uh, a record which will, for obvious reasons, never be bettered at this point. Uh, then in um, 1979, I wrote a book, or a book, I wrote it in 78, it was published in 79, called Crisis Investing, that uh, became the largest selling financial book in history uh, in 1980 and 81, uh, and then I wrote another book, a stock market book, in uh, November of 82 called Strategic Investing, uh, <clears throat> which said the stock market is eventually, uh, well, I said, I didn't say eventually, I said it was going to go to 3,000, which people thought was ridiculous and shocking because the stock market at that point was less than 1,000. Triple? The Dow, Dow would triple? And it did. And, uh, so, and some other books since then. And most recently, um, I wrote a novel with my friend John Hunt, a doctor, called Speculator. First of a s series of six or seven books reforming the unjustly besmirched reputation of some highly politically incorrect occupations. And Speculator is one of those. It's kind of the... Um, it's kind of like the uh, entrance drug, and then we get more radical. Uh, in July, Warlord, is, uh, excuse me, um, <clears throat> uh, a drug lord is coming out, and then Assassin, and it gets more radical from there every year. So that's kind of who I am, and I have a publishing company. We publish a bunch of newsletters, and I guess that's the story uh, from a professional point of view. Doug, you visited over 145 countries, I think, and lived in approximately 10 of them. What have you learned uh, traveling and living in all these different countries? Yeah, it's up to 155, more or less, now, I would say. Oh, wow. But what I've learned is that um, it's very important to have political diversification because I think the markets – in uh, starting, well, it's long overdue. The markets are going to be very, very volatile and uh, uh, dangerous in the years to come, and they're a big risk to everybody's uh, personal well-being. But a bigger risk that nobody thinks about is the political risk. Uh, most people act like uh, potted plants where they have – all their assets in just one country. But uh, things can change very quickly and unexpectedly. And it's very foolish not to be diversified internationally. Preferably you have your business in one country, your residence in another, uh, your savings in another, your citizenship in a fourth country. So uh, that's uh, prudent. No, and that's very important because I think a lot of people are in that paradigm of just looking at the market risk that they face and the markets that they operate or where their assets are allocated. But political risk from personal experience growing up in South Africa is, of course, a, uh, a enormous risk. And by planting multiple flags in different countries, as you just mentioned, um, you do get different treatment in all of these countries as a foreigner with money to spend in different countries. Uh, that's exactly correct. And um, when you broaden your horizon, you can more easily take advantage of opportunities that occur. For instance, uh, I uh, moved to New Zealand in um, 1999. Uh, well, the re reason is because I was playing polo uh, very actively at the time, and it was costing me an arm and a leg to play in Palm Beach and Aspen. Very expensive. And I didn't like the social scene. So I thought, well, I'll go to New Zealand, where it was just a bunch of 
tough friends that liked to play horse hockey when they weren't playing rugby. <laughs> and I managed to buy in at the absolute bottom, uh, real estate wise and currency wise. And it's treated me very, very well down there. And uh, so I've done that a number of times where I go to a different country and I'm paid for living there because I buy things so cheaply and then you sell them after they double or triple or in Hong Kong go up how much like 20 times real estate in Hong Kong, which is most Americans don't have a clue what a real estate market could go up. Yes, it did. Hong Kong. So, um, yeah, that's, I, I think, an intelli a more intelligent way to live life and a, a richer way to live life instead of acting like a, a potted plant, just staying where you were born, like a, a medieval peasant. Absolutely. And especially in the information age that we're living in now, m mobility is going to be, uh, is going to be key for anyone to move around to go where the opportunities are because it's going to move <laughs> even faster as information's traveling and markets opening up a little bit faster. Staying on that. So, uh, where are you? You're in Uruguay right now, but where, where do you call home? I, uh, you're down in La Estancia Cavajete. Uh, yeah, I spend um, most of my time, uh, not more than six months of the year, uh, but uh, because you really don't want to spend more than six months of the year in any country so you can stay out of their tax system and remain legal. Uh, I'm in Argentina most of the time, uh, in Uruguay a lot of the time, and uh, still go back to Aspen during the northern summers. And uh, travel uh, occasionally to uh, places that are interesting to me. I mean, uh, I don't know where uh, I might go next. I might want to go to Sweden and uh, check out firsthand whether it's true that there are 53 no-go areas in Sweden uh, because of the massive migration that they've had there. Because you don't know what to believe when you hear something on television or read an article. So I like to um, check things out firsthand. Absolutely. And by doing that, you create a ton of wonderful stories. And one of my favorite stories that you share is your hobby to talk to a third world political elite and kleptocrats and try to convince them to adopt some free market principles. Can you share this with my listeners? Yeah. Yeah, this has been a hobby of mine that I took up by accident uh, when. Uh, when did I? Uh, sometime in the 70s when um, it's, this isn't really the forum because it would take too long to tell it. I've had some wonderful stories uh, talking to these countries, small, backward countries, preferably run by a military uh, with a Marxist background, uh, bottom-of-the-barrel countries. And um, I give them a radical plan where they can become loved by the people, because usually the people want to kill them. Uh, they can become um, internationally famous in a good light, and where they can legitimately make a huge amount of money because it's harder to steal the way people like Mobutu and Marcos and those, those types have. Uh, so I do that. And um, I guess the last place I, well, I went back to Zimbabwe and met everybody except Mugabe because he was in, in uh, Singapore for medical reasons. But I'll go back to Zim again because I know a lot of people there. And uh, Mauritania, tried that there last year. Actually, I might go to Haiti uh, in a couple of weeks because they have a new president uh, who I think needs some counsel. Uh, and that country is like a standard deviation below almost anything in Africa. It really needs some help. So anyway, that's kind of my hobby. It's very amusing. Now, let's talk about the concept of a speculator. What does that mean to you? And you've had some fantastic wins and memorable losses that you share as a speculator uh, from your first Ferrari business to the famous accident, scam, and psychotic break speculations. Can mm. you share a little bit around the, the concept of a, a, a being a speculator and some of these war stories? 
Well, the whole idea is that um, is that a speculator is very different from an investor. An investor uh, will plant a, a seed, put capital someplace, in hopes that the seed blossoms, and instead of a little uh, seed of corn, he has an ear of corn. This is wonderful. It takes time, but investing is increasingly hard in today's highly politicized world. Uh, a speculator is very different. If we lived in a free market society, it would be very hard to be a speculator because a speculator is one that ideally capitalizes on politically caused distortions in the marketplace. You wait for the government to do something stupid, and then you wait for the inevitable to happen, where they create a distortion in the market, and you wait for it to um, go the opposite way on them. So uh, that is what speculation is all about. Like in my lifetime, uh, the best, advantage, the best uh, example of speculation was buying gold before 1971 or even afterwards because the government, the U.S. government, had artificially suppressed its price for many years. So you just had to wait and you knew it was going to explode upwards in value. And if gold exploded upwards in value, then the gold stocks were going to move up uh, you know, much, much more strongly because they're leveraged. So things like that come up from time to time. Uh, and that's what a speculator does for a living. In the Ferrari business that you started, there was a little bit of a market distortion there as well in your first venture. What was the yeah. distortion and, and how did you take advantage of that? Well, yes, uh, absolutely. Because this was in uh, 1960. This was 1966 in Switzerland, where I was going to college. And um, at that time, uh, in Europe, because remember, this is only 20 years after the end of World War II, uh, Europe, you either had money and you were upper class or you were part of the working class. And the middle class was relatively small. Uh, whereas in the U.S., uh, and of course it's narrowed somewhat since then, in the U.S. it was just the opposite. It was a middle class society. I mean, there weren't too many people on the bottom, not too many people on the top. So in the U.S., everybody wanted a Ferrari, even back then. There was a sports car guy, but nobody could afford a new Ferrari. Uh, whereas in Europe, if you, if, if you were rich, you bought a new Ferrari. When you're through with it, you got rid of it. But there was no aftermarket. There were no middle class guys. So the prices fell. So I found that the price of used Ferraris was very low in Europe and very high, relatively speaking, in the U.S., so I um, went down to Milano and I bought a 250 GTE and uh, advertised it in the U.S. And after driving it and racing it, because you could actually race streetcars in those days, believe it or not. I, uh, and I did in Monza and Monnery, the uh, Autodrome of Paris. So after all this stuff, I managed to sell it uh, after all expenses for a profit sight unseen to a guy in Ohio. And I said, ah, I'm on to something. And this was before the days of, of pollution regulations and all this type of thing. Unfortunately, I got into a, bad, a very bad accident uh, taking it to the boat uh, in Rotterdam. I'd already gone down and picked up a, a bigger Ferrari, a 330 GT. Uh, but, you know, that put paid to that business. And, uh, you know, I, I, I might be doing something else right now if I hadn't had that accident. But, you know, it's life is like that because you come to a fork in the road and you take it. But whether you go left or right, your whole future life can be different. Could go in a completely different direction. And some of the other speculations that you've done is in a very, very in interesting industry, the mining business. Can you huh. share? Because <laughs> this, this ties actually into the book of the speculator. So let me let me rephrase my question. Um, the character in the book is that of the the speculator is that based on personal stories that you've had in the mining industry and in the mining business? Uh, yeah. Uh, every they say that everybody's first novel is autobiographical, and there's some truth to that. 
because I've actually spent a lot of time in Africa, and I see Africa as being, uh, if you want to make money uh, now, today, Africa is the place to go. There's no question about that. Um, and Speculator is a story about a, a 23-year-old guy who uh, is a high school dropout, which I, I, I'm not sure I advise dropping out of high school, but I, I definitely advise young people do not go to college unless you want to learn engineering or uh, hard science or something like that, which very few people in America do. So he goes to Africa um, because he's invested in a mining stock that seems doing well. He gets involved in a, a revolution and a bush war and so forth, makes a huge amount of money. It's a, it's a, it's a very good story. Uh, on many different levels, including talking about the theory of speculation and all this type of thing. So I hope that your, I hope that your listeners and readers buy a copy because it's um, it's a fantastic uh, book, if I do say so myself. And Drug Lord is going to be coming out in July, and it's actually going to be better. Where our hero Charles Knight, after spending seven years in the Orient, comes back and becomes a drug lord in the U.S. Both legal and illegal. Uh, so we explore those businesses and talk about how to engage in them and all this type of thing. So, um, yeah, I, I guess that's the novel speculator in a nutshell. Can I go and wait, wait for the next one? I've really enjoyed your books. And which one was it? Was it crisis investing? That was the one that you went on uh, the Donahue show for. That uh, that was a very very entertaining interview, by the way. If if the listeners are out there, you can go on YouTube and uh, type in uh, Doug Casey uh, Donahue show, um, just discussing uh, what was going on around then in the global economy and some of the politically distorted uh, positions in, in the marketplace. Yeah, that was my timing was quite good. The book was uh, number one on the New York Times list at that time, and. Uh, so Phil Donahue, who in those days, for your younger listeners, uh, was at least as big as Oprah was at her peak. Uh, so I had a full hour by myself with Phil, and it was, happened to be the day before the national elections when Ronald Reagan ran for his, against, I don't know, Jimmy Carter. I even forget who it was that he ran against, McGovern. I, I don't even remember uh, who the Democrat was, but Reagan won. But um, so Phil asked me, he says, well, after having read your book, Crisis Investing, he said, um, I guess you're voting for the libertarian candidate. And I said, no, absolutely not. And he was surprised and he thought a minute, ah, then you must be voting for Mr. Reagan. And at that point, I gave him five reasons or I got as far as giving him four out of the five reasons why I wasn't voting for anybody. And I only got to reason number four because the audience started booing me. Uh, that was one time they started booing me. The other time they started booing me was when I told them that if their kids went to college for anything other than a science, basically, they were idiots. And they're even more idiots today than they would have been back then, uh, going to uh, misallocating four years of time and a huge amount of money have their minds cluttered with all kinds of ridiculous and counterproductive ideas. But the audience also, cheer, you know, it's funny. It's almost like uh, the mob in Shakespeare's Julius Caesar, where they can be swayed by almost anything. They don't think rationally. Uh, in fact, they don't think. They feel. It's emotions. So it's a question of which emotional hot button you hit as to whether they cheer you or boo you. And frankly, I don't give a damn which it is. Uh, but I am amused by watching watching the mob in action. And it's funny, because the mob, you break them down as individuals. Eh, they can be stupid or intelligent, it depends. It's a bell-shaped curve. But once you get them in a mob, uh, they're all blockheads. They're all idiots. So, um, yeah, that, that was a good show. 
No, absolutely. And things haven't changed much if we look at the mob uh, right now in the United States. You spoke about feelings and emotions, and that's where we're at right now. What is your take on, first of all, um, in your book, actually, Conversations with Casey, you actually did a chapter on the Donald for president. And uh, <laughs> we can't really touch about on markets and the economy without looking what what happened in the election. Your take on that? Do you think that Donald does anything, get anything done? Because he's squarely up against the deep state, and uh, the folks in Congress have been bought and paid for a long time. And it seems that Trump is being surrounding himself by some of the same swamp creatures he was going to uh, to drain from the swamp. What's your What's your take on that? Well, I think it's going to end badly for a number of reasons. I mean, it's not that I dislike um, Trump. He's he's not a libertarian to start with. He's an authoritarian. Uh, so that's the first strike against him. If he actually thinks that now he's president, uh, he should run the country, which is not true. All right, this is all bad news. He's got some some stupid, dangerous ideas, like he wants to uh, destroy ISIS I don't give a damn about ISIS. That's not, not our problem. And he wants to fight the Chinese to keep them out of the South China Sea. And he wants to put up import duties and, uh, and save all these dinosaur industries in the U.S. All right, these are all stupid things. <clears throat> but the reason why I generally like Trump, Trump those thing, all these things notwithstanding, is that what we have in the U.S. is a culture war. This is not just a... Um, a political disagreement, like, oh, I like this guy better than that guy. This is an actual vitriolic, visceral level hate between the red counties and the blue counties. It's actually the type of thing you see before a civil war breaks out. It's really serious. And Trump crystallized this because he's come down on um, – on the side of cultural traditionalists where, you know, any, any sensible person has got to despise the Democratic Party at this point. I mean, it's the headquarters for, you know, all these um, terribly corrupt, aberrated people of all types. It's like, it's not a swamp. That's, that's much too cor uh, polite. It's actually a cesspool, uh, the Democratic Party. Everything, without exception, that they want and believe is not just wrong. It's the opposite of the right thing. Uh, of course, the Republicans aren't much better. Uh, if the uh, Democratic Party is the evil party, the Republican Party is the stupid party. Oh, but talking about what's going to happen with Trump. So, unfortunately, I think the economy has been due for a collapse for, for, for several years. I mean, it should have happened several years ago. Uh, but it's been held together by these governments creating trillions and uh, scores of trillions of new currency units. So it'll happen on Trump's reign. They'll blame him. He's associated with the free market for some reason. He is kind of, but because um, he doesn't understand anything about economics, although he does understand business, which is a different thing. And then we're going to get a real left-wing, probably military guy in 2020, so hold on to your hat. This is going to be, this is going to be one. This is they're going to write about this stuff in the history books. You're listening to Doug Casey on the Cashflow Ninja podcast. We will be right back after a word from our sponsor. International Coffee Farms is a real estate-based specialty coffee farm ownership opportunity. You can own deeded half-acre parcels in title, already operating specialty coffee farms in Bogete, Panama. They are turnkey managed professionally on your behalf by a team of local experts with sustainable average income of 12% and with cash flow beginning in 12 to 15 months from the date of your parcel ownership. International Coffee Farms' mission is to own and operate specialty coffee farms in Bogete, Panama that are economically, environmentally, and socially sustainable. As part of this mission, 20% of the gross profits of each farm goes towards a socially sustainable fund to improve the lives of the coffee farmers 
farm workers and their families. International Coffee Farms currently owns and operates eight specialty coffee farms in Boguete, Panama, with parcels available for immediate ownership. To find out how you can become a parcel owner, you can download your free income opportunity report at cashflowninja.com forward slash Panama. You're listening to Doug Casey on the Cashflow Ninja podcast, and now back to our interview. Yeah, it certainly is very, very interesting. And now staying on the economy and markets for a little bit, at the time of recording, we are at all-time highs right now. And you'd mentioned that we've been due for a a huge crisis uh, for for a while now. What's your take on the, the, the markets currently and the global economy? And what do you see playing out through the year? Does it happen this year on Trump's watch? Well... You know what they say about predicting. Uh, if you want to be successful, predict often, because usually you're going to be wrong. <laughs> so that's one thing. Uh, but um, I don't understand why anybody uh, is involved in the stock market today. Uh, the only at the level it is, is because of these scores of trillions of dollars and other currency units that have been created around the world. But we could have a credit collapse easily where it all comes tumbling down catastrophically. So it's very dangerous. Uh, it's very, very hard to buy Graham Dodd type of stocks these days. So what am I doing? Uh, you know, I'm trying to find a place to get short the stock market. I am short the bond market. Because that's a, not just a bubble, it's a super bubble. It's bigger than the tulip mania, the bond market, with interest rates at the levels they are. I mean, approaching zero in some parts of the world. This is actually insane. So um, the only thing that um, really gets my attention are the precious metals, like gold and silver, which aren't at giveaway levels, but they're pretty cheap. So... Um, and I think there's going to be a panic into them. Definitely a safe haven. And I see really exciting stuff happening in the gold and silver space as well with gold money and uh, the cards that they have now in the savings account. Now, you were involved with gold money uh, from their, their inception, correct? Uh, I was. And I guess that's been – gold money has merged with Bitgold. And I own a lot of shares in that, which – I don't pay attention to, which is foolish because it's a lot of money. But I guess that's going to do okay. I met the management, seemed like nice guys. But because Jim Turk, who I have a lot of confidence in, uh, smart guy, honest guy, uh, since he did the deal, I presume it's a good deal. So, uh, you know, I own a bunch of Bitgold at this point. It is called Bitgold, I guess, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, I think it's called Bit- Bitgold. Now, Doug, staying on what's going on in the world, and especially in, in 2017, we've got some more excitement in Europe coming <laughs> coming our way with an election in France where Le Pen seems to be positioned to win. Uh, and Gerd Wilders is very popular in the Netherlands, it seems. And then, of course, uh, last year we had Brexit in the UK, and we've seen uh, the rise of uh, the popularity of the five-star movement in Italy, sending a very, very strong signal to the establishment in the referendum. What do you see happening in Europe this year, and what do you see happening with the European Union and, and just the euro in general? Ah, well, this is about the only bright spot in the world's economy, is that the European Union is going to collapse, die, blow blow away. It was a very bad idea. I mean, having free trade and free travel is wonderful, but you don't need a telephone book-sized treaty and 50,000 bureaucrats in Brussels to regulate it. This is, this is like ridiculous. All you do is you take away the laws again, and duties, and let people go and buy and sell what they want. You don't need any of this union. It's ridiculous. So it's going to dry up and blow away. Uh, And uh, the problem is that people like Le Pen, I mean, she's got some, you know, some wonderful things. She's going to help destroy the union. But she's just a socialist. She's a socialist and a nationalist. She's a national socialist. Uh, 
So that's bad. Uh, I think Wilders in uh, Holland is a different and better creature. Uh, but, you know, the big problem, other than socialism, and Europe is unbelievably corrupt. I, it's a sinking ship. It's the home of Western civilization, which is, you know, it's awful what's happening there. Because their big problem, other than the fact it's totally corrupt and they're all socialists, is that they're going to be invaded by Africa. I mean, the fact that a million Africans and Arabs uh, came to Europe, well, it was actually like a million and a half last year. That's nothing, nothing compared to what's going to happen. There are going to be scores of millions of Africans that are going to come across the Mediterranean. And this is a real problem because Paris and Rome are going to look like Lagos and Kinshasa. And I've been to those places, and they are horrible. So, of course, on the other hand, if I was a young African, uh, I, would, uh, I would get on a boat or a raft or a, a, an inner tube to, cross the, to get to Italy as soon as possible. But this is, uh, this is going to be a real, real problem for, uh, for, for Europe. On the other hand, if you're a young European or a young African, go to Africa. That's where the opportunities are. Because as a speculator, you want an unlevel playing field. You want a playing field where you have an advantage. So go down there because you've got capital, knowledge, connections, everything that the locals don't have. You can make their lives better and make your life much better. Go to Africa, because I promise you, all the Africans are coming to Europe. Doug, you had mentioned about when you look at deals, when we mentioned gold money, you look at you looked at the management and the people that were involved, and that gave you the confidence that this was a good deal. Is there another checklist that you have that you draw on in your decision-making when you evaluate opportunities? Yeah, yeah I talk about it, although it's a novel. Uh, speculator has intertwined within it uh, lots of uh, economic and business and speculative, uh, I'd like to think it's wisdom, but uh, there's something that I've developed called the nine Ps. It's a mnemonic. They're the nine things that you look at before you do anything uh, in the investment or speculative world. And you need a mnemonic, otherwise you might forget something important. So the first one is property, or the business itself, in the case. This is for mining stocks, but it's equally applicable to all kinds of stocks. And the, well, that's not the first one. first one is people. I mean, because good people make for good business. So um, if the people are no good, forget about it. It's a non-starter. That's 50% of the battle right there, more than 50% actually. And then you look at all these other various different things, the pitfalls, the financing with the pH, the, the property, the business itself, the, the, um, the politics, uh, all kinds of, of different things you have to look at. But I, I, I find it hard to find something that's investable today. It uh, seems metaphysically impossible but the whole world, everything in the world is overpriced right now. And it kind of makes sense because all these idiotic governments and central banks have created hundreds of trillions, not just scores of trillions, hundreds of trillions of new currency units. And uh, right now they're sitting in the financial system. Eventually they're going to come down to the retail level and it's going to be very destructive. It's going to destroy the savings of people who save in their local currencies, whether that be dollars or pounds or euros or whatever, it's going to wipe them out. And this is a catastrophe. We're looking at something. This is the biggest thing. This is the biggest thing, not just in our lifetimes that's, uh, that we're looking at. This is the biggest thing since the Industrial Revolution, but not a good thing. Although, on the other hand, I think that... Um, I think that Ray Kurzweil is quite correct about the singularity occurring maybe 20 years, something like that. And uh, the whole nature of the world is going to change because of technology. So that's fascinating being alive right now. 
it is a fascinating time. And you just mentioned the whole world is going to change because of technology. And, you know, we, we see the, these broken systems already. It's very hard to go inside of a broken system and change it from the inside like people have tried to do, where we now see systems outside of the broken system developing. One that I've been keeping my eye on is the digital currency space and Bitcoin. Yeah. What do you make of uh, developments in this area and the approach and the, the philosophy centered around cryptocurrencies? Uh, very, very interesting. Uh, I am a technophile, but... Uh, I also know my limitations, and I tend to use my computer, which I'm speaking to you on right now, as a, as a blunt instrument. Um, so I don't believe I have the technical competence to make a, uh, an, a really intelligent judgment about which ones of these currencies will work. I see them mainly. Uh, they don't fulfill all of the um, characteristics of a good currency, which Aristotle laid out in the fifth century BC, good money, not a good currency is what he said, uh, because they don't have actual utility value in and of themselves. They're very useful, but um, uh, it's not like uh, a piece of metal that if it's not usable as money, well, it's usable for, for a tool or something like that. Most of the things in the world are made out of metal still. So um, I'm, I'm very bullish on these things, but with Bitcoin at a new all-time high, which is about a, now, I guess, I'm not sure what I want to do about it, uh, to tell you the truth. Yeah, that's interesting that that's also you were just saying how uh, most things are extremely expensive. What's your take on real estate right now, too? Because you've had some fantastic investments in real estate across, across the world. Um, where do you see that at, uh, right now? Yeah, real estate has been very, very good to me. Uh, as a matter of fact, it was at our in Cafajate, Argentina, which is where I have a, a real estate development um, that's actually very nice because I wanted a nice place to live, kind of really beautiful with everything in the middle of nowhere where the weather is good and so forth. Uh, that's where I met a guy named um, – a young Belgian guy – I still regret it to this day. Uh, his name was, ah, doesn't matter. He gave me a Bitcoin when we had lunch. It was worth $13 at the time. And it was a physical Bitcoin that has the coding on it and everything. $13. I mean, if I'd understood and thought about it better, I would have bought a bunch of them. But I didn't. So, you know, there's always, you know, there's always, uh, everybody misses more opportunities than they get. Um uh, so uh, real estate, oh, anyway, that was a question I went off on a tangent talk because I was still thinking about Bitcoin, your previous <laughs> question. Um, I don't know. Listen, I own a lot of real estate still. And um, what to think? I don't know. The problem, one of the problems with real estate is this. It's that um, it's very visible. It's easy to tax. Rich people own real estate, and so it's popular to tax it if you own a lot of it or expensive stuff. And in in the U.S. and Canada and other places, it rests on a sea of debt. And, um, of course, the good news is if you finance it today, you're getting debt at giveaway levels, and they're going to destroy the dollar. So that's like a gift. It's a reason to buy real estate. On the other hand, if interest rates go up, that's going to kill real estate. So um, I don't know. Listen, you got to treat most real estate as a consumer good. Your house isn't an investment. It's a consumer good. Treat it like an expensive car or a very expensive suit of clothes. That's what a house is like. Commercial property, different thing. Farming property, different thing. I would definitely agree with you that <laughs> on that. Yeah, your house is definitely not an asset, um, especially as you described as well. Now, Doug, one of the things that I've observed from wealthy and successful people is that they're always studying new subjects and learning new skill sets. What are you currently studying and what skill sets are you currently learning? Well, I like to read. Uh, you can save yourself a lot of time. 
I'm thinking about putting together a book. I mean, I don't have time to do it, but talking about uh, the idea of a Renaissance man, which is, there's three important verbs in every language. They're be, do, and have. And how you ought to relate to what the meaning of those three verbs is. Uh, so part of it is learning things so you can do and change your thought patterns so you can be. And that will allow you to have. The have part isn't very important because all this material crap comes and goes, uh, quite frankly. And then when you die, it all goes anyway. So who are you kidding? Uh, so what am I doing now? Well, you know, my main interest is ancient and medieval history. Uh, I find it fascinating, which is really kind of silly, because it's not very useful from a practical point of view. I mean, I might as well become an expert in Lord of the Rings or uh, uh, or uh, Game of Thrones, uh, frankly. But I do that, and I read science magazines. Uh, I read Discover, and I read um, uh, Scientific American. I read the British one, the New Scientist also. I read those three. And, um, eh, you know, the occasional other thing. I was reading some Shakespeare stories the other day. Uh, really, really brilliant stuff. The original Arthur Conan Doyle stuff. <clears throat> and uh, I read a book by a guy named Gay Talies, famous journalist, uh, called Thy Neighbor's Wife, which is about how we fought and won the sexual revolution. Uh, and that, that was a very good book, incidentally. So I'm eclectic, actually. No, I like that. And I'm a, I love history, too, and especially ancient history, because it's like you said, uh, you know, you might, might as well look at the Lord of the Rings or something like that. But this happened, this is documented history. And, uh, I found it actually more fascinating sometimes than the Lord of the Rings <laughs> stories or, uh, the Game of Thrones. Oh, yeah. What's that? No, it just uh, some of the stories that happened uh, in the past. I mean, especially Roman history, which you talk about a lot. Yeah, yeah, it's true. And I, I, I did a long article, ten thousand words. I could make it much longer um, about comparing the collapse of Rome to uh, the collapse of the U.S., which is happening incidentally. Uh, but I was thinking, I it might in some ways be more appropriate. If I, um, I'm going to write an article about the Athenian Empire um, of the 5th century BC, comparing it with the U.S. Empire. It's actually, in many ways, even more analogous than the Roman Empire. Uh, but they all end badly, these empires. I mean, this is why I've been an anarchist for the last, for most of my life. I don't believe in government as an institution. The institution itself is innately corrupt and destructive and stupid. So uh, I always, when, when I get invited to a cocktail party, I mean, if uh, conversation goes to politics, uh, I, I'm almost always the only anarchist uh, in the room. And then if we talk about the other area of practical applied philosophy, which is religion, I get in even more trouble because that's a big problem for people too. Because of course I'm an atheist. So I don't socialize as much as I might. <laughs> It'll be very tough to be a dinner guest at a lot of these parties with, uh, with that philosophy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Especially right now where you can't even, I mean, it's, t it's tough to be in a situation where there are folks that's trapped in the left-right paradigm to even t touch on that because, ev <laughs> you know, everybody's an enemy of you then at that party. Oh, Exactly. Because I'm, uh, the whole left-right paradigm should be flushed. It's ridiculous. It's two sides of the same false coin. Now, Doug, uh, staying on history and writing history right now, history obviously written by the winners, and I think it was Tolstoy that said history would be a wonderful thing if only it was true. But um, the information and writing history right now, people listening to this to, to the, our interview what advice would you give them to try and sift through all of this misinformation and fake news and a lot of the nonsense that's out there in, in, uh, in, in mainstream media? Well, I would draw people's attention to, uh, 
to my novel, Speculator, because it really goes into a lot of these type of things, because Tolstoy didn't write nonfiction. He wrote fiction, basically. And so that's what Speculator is about and Drug Lord is about. And uh, I like my nonfiction book also, which is called Totally Incorrect. Uh, they're all available on Amazon. But uh, I don't know. What should people be doing right now? Um, I think they should, uh, to use, a, to use a, a quote from Game of Thrones, which I thought was quite good, winter is coming. So what do you do if you're a smart squirrel and you know that winter is coming? Well, you try to put some things aside because you want to survive. You don't want to be inconvenienced. by. Uh, you don't want to have to be grubbing for roots and berries if things change radically. So people ought to keep that on their minds, I think. Uh, they don't think about that now. Doug, a core message in our show, too, is to leave our families and our communities and world better than we found it by passing down a mindset and some values and principles to future generations, not money. And you do a great job of that already, trying to influence the way that we think um, and to have people pass that on to future generations. But if you cannot pass on any money to future generations and we're only allowed to pass on to them three principles to build wealth and achieve happiness and success, what would they be? Well, one of them is don't give money to charities. Don't give it to organized charities. And... I wrote an essay on that and totally incorrect. It's a very stupid and just counterproductive and destructive thing, leaving money to NGOs and charities for lots of reasons we don't have time to go into now. But uh, other than that, um, God, it's so hard to sum these things up. And I hadn't thought about that, your question, before I put it into three simple things. But, uh, you know, frankly... As a libertarian, I recognize that being a libertarian, which is somebody that does not believe in aggression, not initiating aggression, and believes in free minds and free markets, you know, frankly, uh, we're genetic mutants. And most people uh, don't believe it and uh, don't understand it. So, uh, you know, uh, I don't think we can change anything. And I do and say what I do simply not, not because I expect to change anything or influence anything. I do it uh, because it's good karma and also because I find it amusing. And uh, if you can't amuse yourself while you're on this planet, then you're really wasting your time. Doug, how can my audience learn more about you and your books and stay informed of all of the projects that you're involved with? Well, this should, we have a free blog called internationalman.com. They should subscribe to that. It's free. And then we have another blog called at caseyresearch.com. I don't know what that blog is called, but it's there on that website. And other than that, they can go on Amazon and, um, you know, put my name in there and you'll see these books. So uh, people are interested. They can do that. And I got a lot of videos on YouTube, too for people that like to do YouTube. Well, there's a ton of information out there, and if you Google it, you'll get to learn all about Doug's interesting takes on the TSA, nanny state, charities, <laughs> the war on terror, and more. Doug, thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing your journey and your knowledge and providing so much value for my listeners. I had a fantastic time, and it's been an honor having you on the show. Well, thanks, MC, and we can do it again sometime. Why not? Hi, this is MC Lobsher, the host of the Cashflow Ninja podcast. As you may know, I'm also the president and chief wealth strategist of Valhalla Wealth Financial. We help individuals, families, small businesses, entrepreneurs, and professionals build their wealth outside of Wall Street and help investors maximize the use of every dollar in their personal economy and boost their investment gains. We do this by combining their capital and investments with the financial vehicle of the wealthy, according to the infinite banking concept. If you are interested in learning more, you can email me at info at cashflowninja.com and I will send you a copy of Nelson Nash's book, Becoming Your Own Banker. 
Thank you for joining my guest, Doug Casey, and myself on the Cashflow Ninja today. If you like what you hear and appreciate what we're trying to build here at the Cashflow Ninja, please subscribe, rate, and review our show on iTunes, and share our show with family, friends, and your network. I'm always trying to learn and improve in every area of my life, so if there's any way that I can provide more value to you and serve you better, please reach out to me at info at cashflowninja.com. Jimmy Freeland and Bob Scott have been in your shoes and have used real estate investing to become financially free. They've designed a system to take any beginner to an experienced deal-making investor in the least amount of time. They offer opportunities from basic education, coaching, bridge loan investing to turnkey investments in the cash flowing market of St. Louis, Missouri. For more information, please call joinopsproperties.com or call Jimmy and Bob at 314-799-2247. Coffee is a proven product and a $90 billion industry worldwide. Through international coffee farms, you have a chance to own and operate your own half-acre parcels in a specialty coffee farm in Panama, professionally turnkey managed for you. You can download your coffee farm ownership opportunity report at cashflowninja.com forward slash Panama. That's our show for today, everyone. Until next time, live a life of passion and purpose on your terms. You have been listening to the Cash Flow Ninja with your host, MC Laubscher, the podcast empowering and inspiring people to discover how to generate their own income and manage, grow, and protect their own wealth in the new economy. Today's show notes and resources are available on our website, CashflowNinja.com. This presentation is for educational and informational purposes only. The information being presented and considered does not consider your particular financial objectives or situation, and it does not make personalized recommendations. This material is not intended to replace the advice of a qualified tax and legal advisor or other qualified professionals, and you should not use the information in place of a customized consultation with a licensed professional regarding your specific personal financial objective, situation, and needs. We believe the information provided is reliable, but we do not guarantee its accuracy, timeliness, or completeness. 